It's an incredible privilege and honor to, um, to have been invited here to this conference to speak today. And you know, I, I hear these stories, and it's, it's incredible. It's just, it reminds me of, of why, I'm, why I went to medical school in the first place. Um, you know, my motivations to go into the medical profession were manyfold, but at the core of my drive was this desire um, to address health inequity, to be part of the battle, to um, fight this uh, this notion that where you live, how much money you make, or what you look like could determine um, the care you receive, whether you live or die, as we're hearing. Um, and some of those motivations came from my family um, and from personal experiences. My father fled a dictatorial regime in Haiti. Now he's an internal medicine physician in an internal, uh, in, a, in an underserved region of the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. Um, my mother is from Mexico. She was a school teacher there. Uh, she grew up in a rural area in Tampico, and, and she didn't have access to many health care resources in her area. Some of my motivations for medicine come from personal experiences, um, some of them very painful. Um, my grandfather, Abuelito Felix, on my mother's side, him with the sombrero up there, um, yeah, he, he was a cowboy. He was a spry, um, active guy. He ca tended to cattle. He had a ranch of his own. Uh, he was a family man. Uh, my, my mother was his only daughter, and he had three sons. Um, unfortunately, I only have a few fleeting memories of him. Um, when he was 70 years old, he was tending to cattle, uh, fell onto his side, and sustained a hip fracture. And where he lived in Mexico, there wasn't an orthopedic surgeon who could take care of this fracture, and he lay in bed in traction, um, his blood pooling, waiting for a surgeon to show up that might be able to fix this problem, and that surgeon never came. We couldn't find one. Uh, eventually, a few weeks after he had this fall, he died of a pulmonary embolism, a clot developed through to his lungs. And one of my earliest memories is my mother crying inconsolably when we heard of his sudden death. You know, he was a healthy guy, and this was a really painful early lesson in how health inequity could, could be fatal. Um, and then in medical school, I learned that this kind of inequity was present here in the United States. We're hearing about it from all of the presenters here today. I don't need to rehash these findings. The richest American men and women in this country live 10 to 15 years longer than those from the lowest socioeconomic strata. They say money cannot buy happiness, but in the United States, it seems that it can buy life sometimes. Racial inequities and... Um, Disparities are more pervasive, more insidious. We heard about them as well. In health affairs recently, they featured some of these findings. Black men and women have a life expectancy lower than their white counterparts and, and Latino counterparts at birth um, by five to 10 years, even when controlling for comorbidities um, and, uh, and, and demographic factors. Uh, they are more likely to receive low value care and looking at Medicare data. Um, you know, my grandfather, he died in Mexico in 1994 because he couldn't find a surgeon to fix his hip. In 2007, a 14-year-old boy, DeMonte Driver, died from a tooth infection that became a brain abscess when his family couldn't find a dentist to take his Medicaid in Maryland. We have a terrible problem in this country, and it was why I got into medicine and why many of my colleagues in medical school went into medicine as well. Um, I was surrounded by bright peers uh, who were committed to dedicating their careers um, to addressing these health inequities. And I, my, my graduation speech was about my optimism and confidence in this generation to be the group of doctors who were going to tackle all of these problems, the cost in the healthcare system, the disparities in outcomes, and fix them. And you know, after we graduated, we were spread to the wind in different residency programs. Um, and I'm in my residency now. Residency is this period between graduating medical school and being an independent practicing uh, physician. Um, it ranges from three to seven years, and it's grueling. My work is very gratifying. Every day I make an impact on someone. I feel like I'm able to make a genuine human connection, and I remember that medicine was a calling, not just a job. Um, but many of those moments that I'm having with patients that I cherish are increasingly fleeting, or worse, tarnished um, by the facets of this fragmented healthcare system. Um, 
you know, in my medical training, my colleagues and I are identifying a myriad of forces that are wedging themselves between our patients and us, and our patients and their care, whether it's exorbitant health care prices from drugs uh, or an overburden of administrative information or a lack of portability in electronic health records. You know, you interface with all of these things after learning in medical school and growing up your entire life that, thinking you were going into a profession dedicated to rooting out inequities and then becoming part of a system that perpetuates them and it's disheartening. Now people ask me what the most difficult aspect of becoming a doctor is. It's not the board exams or learning complex surgeries. For me, it's bearing witness to the suffering that my patients and my peers are going through and feeling utterly powerless to do anything about it. Um, we're a generation of doctors who learned about social determinants of health. We're astute of the disparities in health care. Uh, you know, but we never had a class on EMR design. I, I have no idea until as of late maybe how to do the things that Mr. Mitchell is doing, advocating for himself and other patients. We don't have that built into our education. And increasingly, uh, physicians, particularly in residency, are, are burnt out. They're disenchanted with the system that they're a part of. Estimates indicate that 40 to 70 percent of residents are burnt out or exhibiting symptoms of burnout. At the beginning of residency, almost half of us say we're going to go into a career in academic medicine where you join the chorus of voices asking for more research to root out these disparities. And by the end of our training, less than 16 percent of us do that. That's where I think there's a big opportunity loss. That's where I think we're losing a group of people who are capable of coming up with the solutions to the problems in our health care. Um, and I think a big part of what's happening is we're becoming ingrained with this hidden curriculum. You know. um, every day, invariably, one of my patient encounters is interrupted when I have to go order redundant tests for a patient because their electronic medical records didn't come across to our system. Um, I have to try to counsel patients on a medication to prevent clots that they can't get because their insurance coverage won't um, won't provide for it. And I'm learning that depending on the setting that I'm taking care of patients, you can expect different outcomes. And I see my peers and my mentors relying on preconceived notions of what it means to take care of someone to dictate care. And this is the hidden curriculum. This is something that ingrains itself um, in our teaching and it starts to take over. You know, we're taught to promote beneficence and do all these incredible things, but and then you get into the system and you don't understand it. You don't know how to navigate it. Um, and things like this happen. So I think that there are a few things that we could do to potentially change the healthcare system, starting with the graduate medical education system. Um, and I'm going to talk briefly about these things. I think that we could integrate a third science into graduate medical education. We typically think of medical education as basic science and clinical science. I think that increasingly we need doctors to be educated about systems. We need them thinking about the prices that patients are paying for their medications. We need them to uh, not only absorb the information about cultural competency or health disparities, but also think about the systems in which they occur, the context that structural racism and violence takes place in and how to address those things on a policy level, on an advocacy level, on a legislative level. I think that we need to restructure the cost of medical education. A huge barrier when I was talking to my resident colleagues um, for pursuing a career in academic medicine or having chosen a specialty that isn't primary care was the exorbitant number of med school loans that they have. Um, and when we talk about this uh, systems curricula, it's already happening. The American Medical Association is trying to implement some of these models uh, in medical school, and I'm advocating that we do the same in residency programs, not just haphazard online modules, but really integrating and protecting time so that residents can learn about how to address problems in the healthcare system at that level, the systemic level. Um, when we're thinking about these medical school loans that resident physicians are dealing with. I think that if you were to ask politicians across the spectrum if we needed to address a shortage of physicians in this country, they would say yes. Um, and there's a projected shortage of physicians between 40,000, uh, depending on who you ask, between 41,000 and 100,000 um, to be expected by 2030. But funding for graduate medical education has been, has been frozen since 1996. 
Um, I think that we should increase and restructure graduate medical education. And a, an idea that I ha have kind of grown um, to embrace is perhaps waiving tuition for medical students in the United States in exchange for a period of service at the end of residency, thinking of this as a civic duty to after medical school in exchange for forgiveness of your loans serve in an underserved area. And that happens for a small number of people through the National Health Service Corps, um, but I think that that needs to happen on a, on a wider scale. Um, I'm going to tell another story uh, because I, I think that we're, we're talking a lot about about the value of health care and I, I want to illustrate that maybe it's time that we also think about the values that dictate that value. Um, my younger brother, Alan, uh, is diagnosed bipolar. Uh, two years ago now, uh, he was in the midst of a manic episode. He was having a mental health crisis and he recognized it. He recognized it. His father is a physician, I'm a physician, and I was a medical student at the time. And he tried to drive himself to a hospital in Houston seeking specifically mental health care. Um, he crashed his car outside of the hospital and he was admitted to this hospital in Houston, but he was never evaluated by a psychiatrist. People wanted to chalk up his altered mental status to different causes, to trauma or to drugs, even though none of the clinical studies indicated that those were contributing factors. And he stayed in the hospital overnight, um, despite corroboration from my parents asking that he be evaluated by a psychiatrist. It never happened. And the next day, he was in his room in an increasingly dilute, um, diluted state. He was wandering in and out of his hospital room. And in this hospital, the protocol for dealing with a patient who was confused, whether it be from drugs or uh, medications or a mental health crisis, was to call security. This is the way that they were dealing with their systemic issues. And as my brother was in his hospital room, alone, unarmed, um, disrobed actually, two off-duty police officers were called to his room uh, to deal with his confusion. Not a physician, not a nurse, and even though he'd been in the hospital for 18 hours at that point, give or take, uh, and had not caused any issue and had been in his room alone essentially, it took one minute in an altercation with these officers or an encounter with these officers for him to go from a patient seeking care to in their eyes, a criminal on the ground bleeding from a bullet wound in his chest. Uh, they tased him and they shot him and rather than asking for medical attention, they clasped handcuffs on his wrists and threw, threw a drape over him. Miraculously, my brother did survive um, and he went on to speak about his experience and tell people what happened to him to prevent it from happening to other people. And I tell this story because I think that it's an indictment, one of the strongest indictments of our healthcare system, and, the way, and in a way our collective belief uh, in the American dream. Um, you know, my parents came here from Mexico and Haiti to escape violence. Um, they tried to stay above the, the fray of racial strife, and still this happened to their son. And we're talking about gaps in healthcare, barriers to treatment. Can you imagine hearing that the son of a physician sought mental health treatment at a hospital and instead wound up with a bullet in his chest. What message does that send to our patients when these kinds of things happen? Um, you know, he, Alan went on to tell his story and what I'm getting at is that when I was asking people in training what they thought were the redeeming values in our profession, what kind of things we could work on, or what moments in their careers thus far were giving them hope, they didn't really bring up cost initiatives or quality control studies, they talked about building a hospital in Tanzania with a group of other physicians uh, to build surgical capacity, uh, dismantling racism in a healthcare system in UCLA. Um, I thought of my own experiences and how when my brother was shot and we lost all faith in the healthcare system, we banded together and advocated for policies urging that weapons be banned or limited in hospital settings, that de-escalation training happen. And this, to me, was reflective of this principle of solidarity. Um, when we're thinking of ways to tackle the healthcare debate now at this point of uncertainty, I think that it's great that we talk about cost. I think it's incredible that we're coming up with designs and innovative ways to change the way we interface with the healthcare system. But I also think that we need to come back to ethical, uh, an ethical framework for dictating whether or not a health intervention is necessary. And, 
This principle of solidarity is re-emerging in bioethics. It's, in short, this communal form of altruism, an intersubjective sense of altruism as a, as a good, as a, as a moral good. And it's kind of this interface between benevolence, justice, and sympathy. Um, I think that as we're trying to innovate and change our graduate medical education system, this is an ethical principle that we can integrate into the way that we're designing our healthcare systems. And it's something that's being done already. People are evaluating markets in the NHS and using ethical decision-making trees to decide whether or not a health intervention is ethical, not just cost uh, effective, but whether or not it's true to our values. Um, and in changing our medical education system, I think that this is one way that we can educate physicians uh, and potentially just everyday people on how to think about whether or not something is warranted. As we're approaching the next healthcare debate, um, I believe that this is a principle that we can cling on to and use in a systemic way as an outcome measure when we're looking at research. Um, and when we and asking ourselves as well when we're trying to come up with those consensus with, with that consensus on what the next healthcare legislation is going to be, what we're looking for. You know, I think of my family's story: a grandfather dying of a preventable complication in Mexico, my father fleeing civil strife in Haiti, my brother being shot in the most sacred of spaces, a hospital, and it saddens me to see this intergenerational cycle of structural violence. Um, but I see these kinds of things happening every day to my patients. Um, and one of my favorite quotes from Martin Luther King Jr. is, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And in seeking redemption in my profession, I hearken back to the values my parents raised and uh, raised when teaching me to cherish this country. Liberty, freedom, justice, equality, and I think now solidarity. We think of the four principal bioethical, the four bioethical principles in medicine to traditionally be autonomy, justice, uh, non-maleficence, and, and beneficence. I think that fifth one should be solidarity. Um, we have to empower those on the front lines of the healthcare system, whether that's patients, providers, legislators, um, anyone who is going to make a change in the healthcare system. Uh, now, at this critical point, I think can start with solidarity. And maybe that's what will take us to the next frontier. Thank you.